Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Brothers and sisters, I welcome every single one of you here once again at your center, the UMA Center. And tonight we have not a guest, but he is a host. He is a host before he is a guest. And that's our brother, uh, Danny Miqati, who will be, inshallah, sharing with you a lot of his experiences, in which, inshallah, you'll pick up and you'll understand from his experience, from his speech, on how to deal with the children, challenges dealing with the children, from his background working as a police officer in New South Wales Police, and also from his background working at the community, and in particular his background in which we went to school together at Pachwa Boys High School. And that's the most important experience in your life. Anyway, so inshallah, Brother Danny, inshallah, we'll be talking about the 21st century global experience have parents facing very difficult challenges, especially in dealing with their children. And inshallah, the topic of tonight's uh, talk will be parent, parenting challenges, parenting challenges in these times by Brother Danny Miqati. Inshallah, I'll leave it to him. And then half an hour before Salat al Isha, at about 9 o'clock after he delivers his talk, 45 minutes to an hour max, inshallah we'll open the floor to questions and answers. And there'll be papers going around with pens if you want to write your question on the paper. And then it will be passed on to Brother Dani. Jazakumullah khaira. And once again, my brothers and my sisters, I welcome you here all to the UMA Center. And I'll leave you inshallah with the parenting, uh, parenting challenges in these days. First and foremost, thank you to the beloved Sheikh Shedi. Thank you to the UMA uh, for again opening its heart and doors to me. Uh, my many discussions um, leading up to this presentation, um, discussing with, uh, with the Sheikh on what's the most pertinent issue, and he asked <coughs> me, what, what do you think we need to address? From the amount of questions I've been getting and the situations I'm coming across, parenting's got to be on top. And this is not about um, how to look after your two-year-old or your three-year-old. Because if you see my newborn and my seven-year-old, I'm not the last person to tell you how to do it. Um, but <coughs> this is more about our problem children. This is more about those teenage years. This is more about an awareness of the disconnect. Um, if you grew up in the 70s, 80s, or before that, to the times we have now, very, very different times. Um, so I decided the best thing to do is to discuss things that are happening on the ground right now. If we even think about, and most people in this room are about my kind of vintage, think about how it was for us at school. Think about your year six, year five, year four experience. What do you remember of it? What issues were you aware of what was happening at the world at the time? Do you remember when you were in year five, even considering another country besides Australia <coughs> about anything? Unless maybe the odd trip to Lebanon every now and then, back home or wherever you were from? Probably not. I don't remember once ever in classroom with my friends discussing issues happening in another country. For many of us, the most global issue that was happening was the flight of the Palestinians. But even that, as a primary school kid, I don't remember ever discussing it. Maybe year 10, 11, year 12, with a bit of the influx of people coming in, immigrating, maybe. The university, everyone becomes a political analyst. But primary school, not much. Fast forward to these days. Mention certain words that are global your kids will know it. It makes us have to understand we can't parent the way we were parented for these times. Because we're in a different age. So it makes no sense to use the same mechanics for a completely different beast. When I have to go to schools where kindergarten kids and year one kids are asked what type of Muslim are you? By other kids, six and five years of age is meant to explain what sect he's from. Kindergarten, first class, southwest Sydney. No one isolated problem. 
when you four and you five and you six kids want to debate what's happening in Saudi Arabia, what's happening in Iran, we're in different times. There are many factors that have led to this and caused this. And I don't have the liberty of going into a six month workshop experience to go through all that. So let's focus on things that we can practically analyze. What do we have these days that connects us to the world that we didn't have before? Internet, social media, your phones. For some reason, these days, every kid needs a smartphone. My first mobile phone was in my first year of university. And because the charges were astronomical, that was only for receiving calls. And it was about this big and gave me a hernia. And the battery life was terrible. And I remember each battery was this big. And some of the older guys were like, yeah, yeah, the rest are like, this guy's so ancient. I never needed a mobile phone when I was in school. I mean, unless your kids are genius and checking the stock quotes during recess, why do we need a phone with internet capability at school? Why? Because his friend Ali and Khadija they have that one too. So we need one. As stupid as that premise is, it's what drives you to, to give your kids, because you don't want to be the one parent that doesn't give his kids the, the iPhone or whatever it is. Even at primary school. Why? Then we can get the argument, but it's safety. I remember addressing a parenting group not long ago. And I was talking about mobile phone. It used to be my big bugbear for me. I'm the anti-phone for kids advocate. I've always had been. If you see what I see, you'd know what. And one of the parents was telling me, he needs to have a phone in year five and year six because when he finishes school, I want to make sure he gets home all right, I want all that kind of stuff. It became a fad then that kids would roll other kids for their phones on trains and buses and whatever. You, you made your kid a target by giving them something that's worth four, four or five hundred bucks. You wouldn't give your kid three hundred, four hundred dollars in cash to school, but we'll give them a phone that's worth that much. Other kids picked up on that and started rolling kids. So we got involved and started doing awareness campaigns. Primary school. Cost-benefit analysis here. I've never met a school in Sydney that doesn't have a phone. And realistically, most schools pretty much finish the same time. Think you know where your kid's going to be, what time he's going to finish school. And after a period of time, I'm pretty sure we work out what time the bus comes, what time the train comes, what time you should end up at it. Uh -huh. What are we teaching our kids here as well? What are the cost benefit analysis? Let's think about it. When a 12 and 13 year old girl at a local high school had to get called into the principal's office because they're threatening each other with sectarian slurs and showing videos of beheadings on their phone I think the purpose of that phone is not really working out for us. The difference you've got these days, brothers and sisters, is that it's 24-7 streaming uncensored images, which you can't control. Because if you're lucky enough that your child listens to you and doesn't take that stuff to school, I can guarantee you there's another 50 that do. So they can show this the images on their phones. Something we don't consider. All of a sudden, kids are learning about things that are very adult at a very, very early age. Things we don't want them to learn. Things you can't unlearn. What's the cost-benefit analysis here? We're about teaching our kids resilience and empowering, and that's what it should be. Teach him and her how to get from home to school, from school to home. And once we trust them, we've taught them a skill. We've empowered them. That's what you're there for, giving them life lessons. So they call you dad, I'm at the bus stop. 20 minutes later, I'm home. 
Okay, if you're that worried, when you finish the school, go to the school office, I need to call my dad. Guess what, free call. What did you accomplish? And as they get older, give them more responsibilities. If there's, high, if there's training after school for football, whatever it is, well then we're now, we add 30 minutes, we add 40 minutes. My advice, you know what? How about we take the day off the first one or two times? Don't tell the kid, go watch. Watch them go from training, get onto the bus and get home. Isn't that more important? Some people take the day off for fishing. They go for all kinds of stupid stuff. How about you take the day off for your son or daughter? Here's a stupid idea. How about that? We need to work out our priorities in life and not just talk about it, be it, embody it. We need to lead by example. Our issue these days, and those of you that know about me, that this is something I harp on a lot about. I have a saying, practice what you post. Everybody has got this most amazing character on their Facebook account, on their Twitter account. And then you meet them in real life. You can't fake parenting to your kids. You can't fake being religious to your kids because they see through that rubbish. If you're going to be religious, don't be religious. I, don't, like I call it Islam by Sizzler. I don't want the lettuce, I don't want the onions. Maybe that's why they close it down. But I'll do this and I'll do that. It's not Islam for punishment only. That doesn't work. How do I espouse religious views without espousing religious etiquette and manner? I'm trying to get my son to pray on time by belting him. Don't remember that in any of the stuff that I read. On our prophet. Sorry, sorry. Let's really think about what we're doing. Perfect example. It's final like yesterday. A restaurant owner came to me to show me some footage. Somebody walked into his shop, asked him, Is your meat halal? He said, No. So he grabbed the chair and threw it through the window. There were 12 kids inside after school in that restaurant. If you saw the horror on their face running out and hoping that the glass didn't touch them. Because it wasn't halal. Really? Lead by example. We have to look at what our kids are facing and understand a way on how to deal with it and how to counter it. Social media cannot be stopped. I'm not asking you to switch off the internet. Although sometimes I wish I could. But we can take practical measures to mitigate the risk. You can't deny now these days, we can't deny the kids, whether it's a tablet, a laptop, a computer, whatever. Even now the syllabus in school, it's pretty much a prerequisite. You need to have this stuff to keep up with the schooling. And I'm talking about primary school, not even high school yet. I can't believe the stuff my year year two girl comes back with. Wow, that was my computing studies in year 12 as an option. Now it's, it's embedded in the course. And it makes sense, that's the way of the world. We need to know technology, fair enough. But what about the safeguards around that? Because that computer, unless, you know, humbly you're very, very well off, if you've got five kids and each kid has their own computer, well, good luck to you. But usually most families, there might be one or two. And they're different ages in the family. And if it's the computer that I'm going to use, is the same computer my daughter's going to use, Where are all the safeguards around what she can see and what she can't see? I'm not going to have all this filtering on my stuff. And now, as parents, we're expected to have this level of computer savviness that you know how to control content on the internet and set those controls. Some households, yes. Some households, no chance. They're struggling with the English language, let alone computer literacy. As parents, we want to raise kids... (coughs) Nowadays, here, we have to be ahead of the game. So, take practical measures. The computer, not in the son's or daughter's bedroom. Outside in the lounge room. See who's chatting to her or him. You don't want me to tell you stories about that. 
grooming, people hunting. Think about the content we put on, on Facebook, just on that. Some people, every meal, oh, I had a mad cook there from this place, that's on the Facebook. Uh, I caught a train, Facebook. Um, new lipstick, Facebook. All right. But then there's my kid at the swimming carnival. My kid at gymnastics. What are they wearing? How many eyes are seeing these pictures? Would you take a photo of your son or daughter in a bikini if they're seven or five years old, print it out, and then go walk around showing randoms? You wouldn't, would you? But that's what we do every day. Then you've got the people that feel the need to raise awareness by showing gruesome killings on their, on their Facebook feeds. We all know there's wars. That ship has sailed. We all know what's going on in the Middle East. Why does my nine-year-old need to see it? Why does yours? Responsibility. We've got to look at this. You might have protective stuff over your account. I only show things on my, only my friends can see it. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you can't control what your friends show or what phones they're using because their kids are looking at it and they're all on the same account. What's the point to me? What's the point of showing someone getting stabbed to death, shot to death, beheaded? What awareness are you trying to raise here? What can't you just say if that's the case? Why do you have to show the video footage? You'd never show that to your kid at home. You're in a shopping center. Someone decides to kill himself. Would you bring your son to come watch? But you'll video it and show it to everybody. Why? These are the things I can't comprehend. We've lost common sense when it comes to social media completely because we're inexperienced. Well, hopefully we can change some of that tonight. Let's start looking at those kind of things. On the flip side, back in the day, we might have got bullied as kids. Yeah, pick on someone. I was my glasses had curly hair. I was finished, right? But three o'clock comes, the bullying ends for me. I go home. Try it now. Twenty-four-seven bullying. You never want to be in a situation that I've been in, telling a parent how their teenager suicided over Facebook bullying. Because kids can't cop getting teased 24-7. Which goes back to the fundamental thing. Why didn't my son tell me he was getting bullied? Look in the mirror. Ask yourself why. Do you engage with your son? And this part of the talk is for the fathers in the room. And the wannabe fathers in the room. Because if I had to answer... What is only one thing affecting our community in its darkness? I'd say fatherhood, or lack thereof. If you're going to take the plunge and have a child, you want to be a dad, be a dad. Hang it out at a cafe all day, discussing rubbish while your wife takes care of the kids, is not being a dad. Missing every single parent-teacher night for every single kid from year 1 to year 12 is not being a dad. Never taking your kid to soccer training or taking him home or when he's sick to the doctor or blah, 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 blah. That's not fatherhood. And where did you see examples of this in our Islamic history? Since when did the father have no responsibility over his kid? But you want to purchase land. I walk around to these cafes and these guys are like, this is halal, this is haram, this is halal. Dude, you got six kids and three of them are expelled. And one's in jail. You want to preach to me halal haram? Go home. Look after your son, the one you got left. We have to take responsibility as fathers. It's not a slam by the birth certificate. But amen, we have to embody it. So the scenario would be like this. My son comes home from school one day. He's got a ball. I didn't buy him that ball. Nice NRL football. 
had to be bulldogs. And he comes home. I've got to ask him, but where would you get that ball from? Oh, my friend gave it to me, blah, blah, blah. Which friend? Ahmed. What's Ahmed's last name? Blah, blah, blah. Where does he live? Blah, blah. Who's his dad? Blah. I need to know the circle my kid is with. Because he's not with me for most of the day. He's with somebody else. So I need to know who these children are, who their parents are, where they live, what's their number, so I can make contact with the friends of my children. Once our children are in year seven, year eight and onwards, you must know who their circle is. And if you don't now, catch up. You need to know the circle of influence around your kids. It is absolutely crucial. Because you know when a kid goes missing, that's the first thing I go looking for. Who's the circle? And I head up every single kid in that circle. You know what's sad? When only the teacher knows who the circle is. And I go to the father, so when was the last time you saw your dad? Uh, your son, I don't know, this time. What's his best friend's name? I don't know. Where does he hang out? I don't know. Really? Um, what's Josh Reynolds' um, stats for the year? Oh, 300 passes, 400. <laughs> Priorities, man. Know the circle. Extremely fundamental step. Once we understand what kind of friends our son or daughter have, we can then be happy or unhappy. And if we're unhappy with it, what are we going to do about it? Because let me tell you, if they're 12, it's going to be a little bit too late for you to break those ties of friendship that have been formed since you 7. And where were you before they hit 17? Because you can't raise a child at 17. Because it's too late. And the problem is these things start to turn up when they're 14, 15. That becomes a troubled age many times for these kids in these areas. And now you're already playing massive catch-up. You have to do a lot of good work to undo it. If you don't know what's going on, obviously you weren't approachable in the first place. When your son comes home, rewind back to year five, year six. Should Bobo have a school today? No. What did you do today? What did you do that was different today? You know all those times you used to come tugging at you and tell you annoying stories that went nowhere when you were busy doing something and you could hash through? That's payback for all of those. As annoying as it is. Oh dad, I, I, I saw this and then we and this happened and it's, I'll tell you that joke and it's a terrible joke and like you know, I'll flip me. We can't do that anymore. Because I can't afford to disengage from, the, from those children. Because then you're putting all the burden on your wife. Your wife has to be responsible for all of that now. Coach, doctor, nurse, tutor, psychologist, counsellor, whatever, whatever you like. Quran teacher. As long as I wear the beat, I'm all good. We have to stay involved in them. You know, Islam teaches us about those ages, when to be their friend, when to be their mentor, when to be the authority. For good reason. Kids go through phases. The issue is now they're growing up like this and they're coming across adult situations way earlier than you and I ever were. How do I have a, a sectarian discussion with my nine-year-old? Really? I'm going to explain to you how the split came about and where it started from and who's doing what and they shouldn't be looking for differences where kids are the most tolerant age go into your classroom look at the kids how they get along the african kid the asian kid the beautiful we're the idiots that ruin them when we get older but when they're young pure and innocent that's the tolerance level you're stripping them away from it so watch what you talk about in front of them You've got really strong views about blah and blah, that's fantastic. When he's asleep, or when they're not there, when they're not listening. There's a time and place for geopolitical commentary, and it's not in front of your primary school kids. I'll tell you that from now. A 
Addressing children in terms of their schooling is extremely critical. That parent-teacher night is your opportunity once or twice a year, if you're lucky, to see how, this, how your child really is going, not what he's telling you. Blah, 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 the kid's racist, the teacher's racist, he hates me. But <laughs> and then you go and see why. <coughs> know what's happening, year seven to year 12. Don't skip any parent-teacher nightmare. They send out calendars to schools, they tell you when things are happening. If they don't, you ask them. And that's when you go to your boss. Those are the 22nd of March, I'm taking it off. Why? Because my child has parent teacher night. That's why. Because my child is more important than that holiday I'm planning to Fiji and Hawaii, right? That I can get the dates off for that. But if I have to finish two hours or three hours earlier once in a year, I don't think it's too much to ask. But you have to give a crap. You have to give a damn about it. And don't just send your wife to go, or the eldest brother to go, or the sister to go. Because then they're replacing you. Is that what you want? Then you wonder why you don't have control and don't respect you anymore? Where were you? And I know as dads we like to be the authority, we're the ones that do the discipline. That's fine, and I'm all about discipline, let me tell you, because I've seen what, what no discipline does. But again, it's not just in bad stuff. Where's the reward? Are you the generous rewarder as well? When your son comes home and it's a B for this or a 78% or a whatever, yeah, I'm when you get 100. <laughs> or, Dad, well done. Now, and this is the thing we like to do too, we forget that each kid's an individual. Don't take the three brothers out for ice cream because that one kid did something good. Right? Because it's easier. We'll take them all together. Give him some special time too. Whether it's a 20 minute drive around the block, having a talk together, then getting his ice cream, just you and him sit down, have it. This is for what you did, well done. And then now, because of your brother, we're all going now to go, we're going to go watch a movie or whatever. So the other kids... Get the benefit of each one doing well. They encourage each other. We're promoting this unity amongst the family instead of sibling rivalry. But recognizing each child as an individual as well. Reward and punish fairly. Don't get nuts. I don't want to talk too much because I prefer your questions. So as of now, please, if there's questions, shoot. Oh, I hate saying shooting, dribble with um, Ask. <coughs> and if you've got papers, yeah, just bring them, bring them to me. No, men. Yeah, sisters as well. Do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let me just explain it because otherwise people wouldn't have heard it if you're not on the microphone. So a 16, 17 year old is disengaged from his parents. Yeah. No control. Is it okay if an older, I'm assuming you mean older brother as in another man, not not the kid's brother? No, no, that's that my, um, my, no, that's that myself in my, in my brother. Okay, so blood brother. Yeah. So is it okay for the older brother to step up and take over? At the end of the day, what choice do you have? If, if dad means nothing to this kid, right? And as an older brother or sister, you still have a say or there's respect there. And the reason that's there is probably because you played more of a father role than the father did in the first place. There's a, there'll be reasons for why you are, you're where you are. Absolutely step in. But there will be situations that because you're in the family, you will be ineffective. You need to bring in an outsider. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you have to do that, do that. If dad can't do crap, mom not, the brother's not, then it's about time to start looking at other options. Some external mediators, whoever they may be, as long as they're good. Because what you need to know is what is the circle of influence on that kid? 
Now, very few are hermits and live, living alone in a, in, a, in a wilderness somewhere in no interaction with anybody. They're going to be influenced by something. And you're trying to extricate them from that circle if it's a negative one. So that's going to be too hard for you as a family to do. So you need someone else to come in if you have to. Yes? Just two questions. No. Yeah, the first one is, do you want to scrap the papers? Are you comfortable for people to just... Yeah, what, are people, what are people going to do? Yeah. Second question. That's what that said. Second question. Um, there are those families where, in, I'm going to be frank, like maybe the child was an accident. Yeah. They're 50, they, you know, they had a child. And the reality is they're just too old to parent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not that there's a disengagement with the children or even the children respect their parents, right? But they're just not there anymore. Like they can't be at the parent teacher nights because maybe he sleeps at six. Or, or maybe his bones start to go after mother. You know, things like that actually yeah. do occur. Interesting condition. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mother, <laughs> mother <laughs> bone artist. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. can't take him to school, catch a bus. Yeah. Like, you understand. Yeah. And kids at 12 or 11 or 10 can't really feel that, oh, well, my dad's got a back pain and he can't get up for me. Or, you know? Yeah. Now, they do have siblings as well, but how about if they're intimidated by their older siblings? Or maybe the older siblings don't have wisdom to parent just because they're not parents like in situations like yeah. that so in situations so just to recap so in situations where the parent or family is not an option for whatever whatever reason it may be again you're going to have to bring in members of the community that are good <coughs> at having some kind of influence over this kid the problem with what we do these days and especially in terms of when our child um, maybe starts has been busted committing a crime or has fallen into the drug um, epidemic we, we really don't know how to handle that without our emotions coming out and it be purely about showing the utter disgrace and disappointment for what's happened and being very aggressive in that because nobody no father or mother want to hear your son has just been you know, locked up for shoplifting and why is he shoplifting when he's got everything? That's the most common thing I get. I don't know why he's stealing. I give him everything he wants. Look at his room. PlayStation, Xbox, blah, blah, blah. What did he steal? Some pair of shoes. Look at all the shoes he's got. Right? Look at the circle he's around. Look at why. What's it about? This is the issue. The problem is, unless you're on the ground, and you understand what's happening, you're not going to think that everything to you is a mystery. Why, 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 why? I'm trying to demystify some of that for you. You need to know what that atmosphere around that kid is. Because in that atmosphere, there's going to be some leaders, and there are going to be a lot of followers. And chances are your kid's one of the followers. So as charismatic as this leader might be, you have to find someone that's more so. Well, there's a bit more of an influence. You'd be surprised the people I use to um, to get these kids out of these things. Because it's not about what I think is right, it's about what I think works. No, sorry, it's what about what I know works. So bring in the right people. Whether you like them or you don't like them. If it's about saving your kids, save your kid. Yes? So bring in the right people. It's not an easy task. You're talking about this kid being with this kid for years. Then for someone to come in and influence them and talk them out of it into whatever, it's made very, very, very hard, difficult. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, um, 100%. Like, I'll, I'll work for myself. Mm. I'll, I'll experience what you're saying. Yeah. You do get emotional. You can't. Yeah. The best, the best, the best way is for the parent to influence them, to move them. Once I was in a situation like that, you know what I did? I started, I went after their mates, their mates, the whole group, but not in a bad way. I started, uh, how do I say, tried to influence them in a good way. Mm. And tried to bring them, the whole group around. Because they were all good kids when they were separate. And once you put them together, Tell me about it. and all, all of these, you know all of these? It's a day, or it's their board, um, letting them out at night. Um, but this, this, you have to control them when they're young age. Really. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I need to watch children. I need to want to watch children. I changed schools. I kept on changing schools. Yeah. And it's, you know, it still didn't work. But this is the thing, because you need to be addressing the issue, not the symptom. Yeah. yeah. You get what I'm saying? The child. So if the kid is playing up, when we move him from that environment and put him somewhere else, then he starts playing up, it shouldn't really be a surprise. Yeah. There are situations, however, and the drug one's a good one. So I had a father come to me many years ago. His son, off the rails, like very, very heavily, heavily involved in the, in, in the drug supply. And he's trying to bring him out, trying to bring him out. And he'd moved places and gone places and done things and brought in all these kind of people. Tried the hard way, the soft way, whatever. Nothing's working for him. There's no point in me telling him off retrospectively on how poorly he did and the decisions that led up to his son being there. That doesn't help anybody. It helps someone else learning before that, before that happens. That's why I'm talking about it now. But for that person, it was a matter of the only way you're going to save this guy is you, and listen, he was still quite young. You grab your kid and you go far, far away from the hood. And there's no networks there, no contacts there, no one phone call, you've got something that you need, blah, 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 blah. And he wasn't willing to do that. Now, it's easier to go to the principal, this is your problem. To the sheriff, this is your problem. To the authority, this is your problem. Habibi, it's your problem. You're the cause of the problem, you're exacerbating the problem, and you're gonna make the problem worse because you're always gonna blame shift. Something we are so good at. Blame this, blame that, blame, this, blame everyone but me. What else is coming through very strongly to our, to our youth these days? I gotta walk up to a kid and I'm basically I'm telling him, let me tell you something, son. The world's against you. They hate us. They don't want us. They're not going to give you the same rights as everybody else. You're not wanted here. You should be angry. You should be, hate what's happening. And then I leave. All right. I do that to one kid, two kids, three kids, four kids. With this, I'm doing it to thousands and thousands of kids. With zero practical solutions. Zero strategies on how to dissipate that, that anger, how to constructively use the emotions you feel, and achieve something for your future. What have you done? I'm giving the kid depression before he wakes up and sees what the real world's like and then gets depressed later. What are you doing that for? And so many of us are guilty of this. Be responsible for what you lecture about, what you talk about, what you post about. Because not all the minds that are listening to you and reading your words are on your age group, of your mentality, and have your way of reasoning. Because guess what? Everyone's got their own opinion on things. But for a child? And all these people that do this, were they like that as kids? No. They never copped that when they were kids. No one sat there and told them bang, 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 bang. Because we didn't have internet. You didn't know what was happening in the world in your face graphically. You don't have Facebook where every genius with a keyboard has got an opinion. Right? What kills me about these people when you see them in the street, they're like... They don't even look at you. But they roar on the keyboard and squeak in real life. These are your, these are your heroes. These are the ones you're listening to. So if you're not listening to them, why expose your kids to it? That's the problem. Don't ever take away the most important thing for that kid. Hope, aspiration, ambition. When, you, when we go to schools, you go to a kid and you ask him, what do you want to be when you grow up? Look, that used to be my favourite question as a kid. You should have seen the stuff I came up with. I want to be a doctor who does this, and I'm a lawyer, and I, and I came out of Ahmad. But at the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that question was like basically telling a kid, you can do whatever you want to do. There's so many opportunities in life. There's this that gave the kid hope and something to strive for. Now it's own. Whether it's year 7, year 8, or year 12, that's a terrible situation to be in where you have no idea what you want to do as a kindergarten kid. I want to be a hairdresser. 
I want to be a fireman. I want to be a fire engine. Right? Okay. That's something. You, you, there's aspiration. You're showing something. I'm going to take away this kid's hope. Don't bother because they'll never let you become here. There's Illuminati. There's Abba Lord. There's... Like, really? You're stripping away that light that you're, that you're looking forward. You can't do that. Kids need ambition. All of us need ambition. So the question is, going back to what I was talking about with the phones, what if the kids already have phones now, or they've had it for God knows how many years, do we take it back off them now, what, what, like what should we do? Look, realistically, I can't give an answer that fits all situations, because every condition is different, right? If the kids had it for a while, and now we're like, we're year 9, year 10, whatever we are, and now you're like, you'll be the biggest abuse if you take the phone off your kids, right? Um, at the end of the day, what we have to rely on? Did we empower this kid and skill him up with the decision-making skills? Right? We have to have open and frank conversations with our children about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And they don't just say no and stop. Explain why. Because too many of us, like Muffy, no, nah, you can't do this. Then that's it. Why? Because I said so. Go to your room. <laughs> right? No, I've done it, man. Don't trust me. Younger kids, okay, as the kids get older, you know all that does? Remember what happened to you? Dad, can I go see whatever? No. <laughs> and all the amazing dua you make, you know, oh, no, no, I hope you this and that. <laughs> you start going all hateful, you know what I mean? You think the kid's not going to do that to you? And then you're like, your dad's like giggling himself and remembering what your son did, you know? So explain why. If there's consequences to actions, the kids need to know. Because, you know, when we get children and they've been in serious trouble at school or whatever, and we sit and talk to them, we get them to lead us through the decisions they made and what their reasoning was to get to the, um, the action that led to us getting involved, right? So this kid got expelled because he threw a chair at his teacher, right? Then we go back and think back. Why did you throw a chair at your teacher? Because I hate her. Okay, why do you hate her, right? Because she does this. How does it make you feel when she... We keep... Going, reducing it, reducing it, reducing it. Where as a parent, to the teacher, bang. <laughs> or these days, the teacher's racist. The teacher's lying. And the 35 other kids that saw it, they're lying too. They're Islamophobic. <laughs> so if we're going to play these games, we're both ways we, we lose. So, honest approach and explain the consequence of those actions. What advice can you give to the children with parents that are stuck raising them uh, in their in their time and not current day? So into the generational gap. And advice to the children. Yeah, and I think also just my own addition, even like you know, first generation yeah. um, from overseas versus kids that grew up here. Yeah. Now, an advice to children in these situations, and again, it's going to be hard to give you a one-size-fits-all, because it depends on the ages, you know, big difference between primary school and high school. <coughs> if you're the parent that's yourself, if you're first generation, you probably can't understand me anyway, so there's no point. But <laughs> this is where a sibling should come into it, realistically, okay? The sibling who's grown up here understands what's going on, they should act as the bridge. And that should be communicated to the parents, so to the older brothers and sisters that are listening to this. This is where you need to step in and tell your parents, listen, this is what it's like over here, and this is what he's going through. Right? And let the parents also be part of that process. Don't shirk the responsibility. Sorry, I don't understand English, and I don't know what school is like here. In my day, there was a cow in the village, and that was life, right? You can't shirk that responsibility to your eldest and just leave it at that. 
because you still have to give parenting wisdoms even if they're the medium for it but you have to be part of the process otherwise why is, why is the, the kids not going to come to you anymore that's a real problem parents are so important or whoever's in authority that gives that that plays that role you can't take that away from yourself and then expect to have authority and power later when it counts it's not going to work Look, in terms of the duties of the dad, look, realistically, we've got some brilliant examples in our faith. How, to, how they speak to their sons, how they give them advice, what kind of leaders were they, and the manner in which they affected that leadership. Yes, we can't be prophets, we can't be companions, but we're supposed to strive for it. So, don't let this parent for you don't substitute your duties to something else to do it for you as a dad you have to if you're the captain of the ship let's say right because we love to talk about that all right so now we're the king of the house and we have the the responsibility and the authority for those of you that are in the corporate world those of you in business when you're the president or the CEO or a manager and the authority is on you, don't you know what's happening in your business? Aren't you completely aware of the minutia of what's happening under your, under your authority? And if you don't, you're, you're not a very good supervisor. In our work is what kills me. In our workplace, the bosses and managers, we always complain about how they micromanage it's over your shoulder for everything. How long was that break? How long was this? Why did you do this? I'm not going to dock your pay for this. We micromanage when it comes to how we make a living. They're a go-to one. Um, football games, some, you see some of the coaches, oh my God, they lose their mind. Right? Some parents, when they become a coach, all of a sudden, my God. Right? Everyone uh, thinks they're, they're Tony Gorse. Like it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. In your private life, in your family life, you don't know what's happening in your own roof? Really? As the head, as the one that has the authority, you should have all the information. And the only way you're going to have all the information is if you have a very good relationship with every single occupant of that house. So that the, the flow of information is free, it's honest, and it's constant. So as a father, that means I must know my daughter's favorite TV show, her favorite color, her favorite food, who her friends are, my son, blah, 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 my wife. I need to know the ins and outs of every person under my responsibility. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job. How can I only know about things when it's too late? That means the information is not traveling to me. I don't blame them, I blame the boss. You're a manager, you're a supervisor, that means you have the authority. With your authority comes responsibility. You can't have it both ways. Like I said, no sizzler. No, 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 I'm happy to have the authority and I'm happy to affect certain rulings in my house, but I'm not happy to have the responsibility side of it. That's a bit too much. And then what happens after that is we get anger, we get frustration between us and our partner. Because I've happily bestowed upon my wife some husband responsibilities. I'm happy to do that. <coughs> Oop, she spoke back to me. Oop. R really? If you want to give her your roles, well then expect to be speak, expect to have another husband instead of having a wife. You've made her a husband, good luck to you. But by, by survival, someone has to play that role. So we have to, to address that situation with the dads. You want to be the boss? Act like it. Know all the information. Reward generously and punish fairly. Yes. an excellent question yeah. so the brother asked um, it's, we were talking about why we'd express certain geopolitical views in front of our children when do you know when to tell them things 
and basically to give them awareness and when do you withhold and not tell them certain things. Think of your world like um, TV ratings. You know, PG, M, R, we don't, a Muslim plan down any further than that. If that's the case, we need to look at what's age appropriate, right? For me to discuss with a kindergarten kid what Bashar is doing, he knows more about what Ronald McDonald is doing. There's no real point in me explaining to him who this guy is, right? What, what am I getting out of that? If I've got a high school kid, right, who's now raising topics with me, then he's raised the topic, let's discuss it in a mature fashion. What you don't want is to be telling, the, is to be telling your kid with seething anger and fury, right, about what the atrocities that are happening overseas, okay, without something to counter that. So I'll give you an example. I'm talking to my year 12 kid, right? We're discussing the Iraq situation, let's say. What was Saddam, what wasn't Saddam, blah, 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 blah. I tell them that there's things we need to understand about imperialism and the West and blah, and blah, and blah. All true. But I can't just leave him like that. I've got to explain to him, so our job, our duty, as Muslims here, is we must strive to lift our community. We must empower ourselves. How do we empower ourselves? We gain knowledge. We put ourselves in high positions. Right? We help our fellow man, whether they're here or they're overseas. It goes back to what are we teaching our kids, what the measure of success is. You know, our parents all the time for us, a university degree, successful. I know my son, he's got a degree, he's at Sydney University, he's at... That, in those days, if you went to uni, the father has, has passed the test and he doesn't need to parent anymore. It's done. It's a done deal. I can now show off to my mates that my kid goes to university. Right? I don't know what's happening now with what the measure of success is with parents these days, across the generation since then. There's all kinds of different things happening now with what it is. Most people don't know. So a child doesn't really know what is the passing grade for mum and dad, for him. What does he have to be? What does she have to be? Right? Is it still about academic excellence? Is it still about what kind of uh, qualifications you can get? Is it about popularity? Is it about wealth? Is it ever about Islam? Has any, has any parent ever told their kid, I'm going to look at you as successful when you have become a good ambassador for our faith? I don't remember hearing that speech anyway. And when my son comes back from year 12 and he does his, I don't know what they're called now, ATARs, HSR, I'm still sure HSC does. He does his whatever acronym it's called and he gets 95%. Uh, Am I still gonna push him to become a doctor? Will I play a role in that decision? When he can pick any job he likes or whatever course of action he wants to take. How am I going to feel if he says to me, you know what, Dad? I think I just want to be a cleaner. Right? And then I ask him why. Because that, if I'm a cleaner, I'll own my own business, right? And then I can have time to do the other projects and to do this. Am I going to get angry? You know what? Yeah, you will. Go be the doctor, and then do the other later, and don't worry, and then give money. and the... We've got to think about that. What is our measure of success? And as a father, you need to have that now. What expectations are we raising our kids for? What is that measure of success? Do we want a child? Everyone prays for a righteous child. But what does righteous mean to you? Someone that drives a Bentley. A lot of parents here. When they see their son roll up in that Bentley, my God, my son's made it. Mm, I wonder what kind of Buddha I was used to get that Bentley. <laughs> so we need to start looking into this kind of thing.
Okay, so the question was about um, homeschooling and whether I'm, I'm pro or against that. Does it, does it mitigate these issues? Look, in fairness, I've got my personal views, but in fairness, a student is a student, right? Depending on how we are as parents encouraging that student, regardless of the environment is in, but the chef just told you we went much more boys, right? <laughs> Don't worry about me, we'll look to him, okay? <laughs> he achieved, right? Why? Because the parents were pro-education, very supportive, and the friends we were around had similar parents. So as a group, we pushed each other to achieve. The homeschooling argument always goes back to, oh, they get a very good education, but they miss out on the extracurricular stuff. The social interaction stuff, the other things. It's the same argument about going to a segregated school or a co-ed school. Later on, you don't know how to interact with, with the opposite sex and blah, blah, blah. These conversations have been going on since time immemorial. Each one of them is subjective. Because there are kids that I'm very happy to be homeschooled. Please stay the hell out of the kids with the public school system because you're ruining the federal ones, right? But then there are kids that will shine from being outside <coughs> of that environment, kids that are, it's disastrous for them. You need to know what kind of kid you have, and you should know that. How do they deal socially? How, how do they learn? What kind of learners are they? You know what I'm saying? So it's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all, because no kid is the same. It's also a good way of touching the question. Thanks, thanks, Alan. <laughs> so how do we go about dis disciplining our kids? Do we beat them? You know what I did for a living, yeah? Um, officially, you should lawfully chastise your, your children. That's just my disclaimer. But in terms of how do we punish a child, how does your, how your son or daughter respond, age appropriate, intellect appropriate, is what the question should be. Because me sitting in around with my one and a half year old, reasoning with him why a fork in an electric socket is not a good idea, is not gonna work, right? If, as soon as he goes to do this, and I tap, right? That makes sense. He gets that. He knows, huh, means, huh, all right. Okay, we're not gonna write a thesis here on the study of conducting electricity and the, you know, the voltage and where the heart stops, we're not going to do that. But doing that to a 16 year old, right, in front of his friends, outside, is disastrous. <laughs> if that's so destructive, you have no idea. Let me tell you the resentment in that son after that. In front of his friends, you put him on show. You belittled him. You did this, this, this. And if as a father of a 16-year-old, you need to resort to physical violence to, to denigrate him, that's a, that's a failing on you, not a failing on him. How many of us in this room, the older ones, when our dad used to look at us, we used to go, where's that? Where's that? I've got an extra 20 kilos on my dad and probably about an extra I don't know, four inches. And a lot better fighter. He looks at me, I shut my mouth. And so does my son. Where is that? Respect. But you don't respect someone you don't love, man. So you, there's a, there's a two-way two street in this. I'd go home terrified of breaking curfew with my dad because I knew what was coming. But I was cheering when I got all A's on my report and I'd run home. That's the difference. Reward generously, be fair in your punishment and explain the consequences why. You're trying to teach your kid judgment. You're trying to teach your kid reasoning. That's how we empower our kids. And don't worry about the other side of it. They'll go through life and they'll be resilient. They'll make the right choices and so on. Is there any more questions from the sisters? Now's a good time to pass them on. Yes? How do you see the drugs affecting the Muslim community in this area? And what type of drugs are you talking about? Is it out of control? Okay, 
So the question is, how do we see the drug situation in our community? How is it affecting our community? What's the most prevalent? This is something, unfortunately, I have a very high specialty in, and this is this is my world now, uh, the drug situation in this community. It's never been this bad. In 16 years in my profession, it's never been this bad. When you've got drugs like ice that are so many times more potent than the predecessors, and cheaper, and easier to get, it's killing us, man. It's killing us. And what's happening is there's such ignorance to what's going on there that it's, it's just becoming a massive epidemic for us. Because of that, a couple of years ago, myself and other members of the community got together. And it was actually at Hajj that we decided um, we're going to go ahead with it. We're going to work towards building a rehab facility for Muslims. And the journey started back then. And since then, while waiting to get the necessary um, everything to build something that's going to cost you over 20 or 30 mil, to be where we need to be, we realised we can't wait for that, so something needs to be happening in the meantime. So, and I'll speak for us. So, Oz Relief, um, which I'm a part of with uh, other directors, Wally and Tom, we've created a program called 180. And 180, as you know, 180, it's about turning lives around. And we've been treating addicts, and all of them have been Muslim so far as young as 12 years of age, yeah, and that's the girl. As young as 12 years of age, up to, I think the least 58, the other one, with the, using everything we've got to case manage them around the clock and use existing services that are around uh, with proper specialists, doctors, psychologists, addiction specialists, to go through the journey with them. But we haven't even advertised or launched yet. We're up to client number 15, and we haven't advertised. Just because one client told someone else, and now this is where we are. Adult, male, female, to child. I'm scared of what will happen when I open the doors. The team I've got right now is working to capacity, already. So we're slowly growing. But I'll tell you what, what's not going to be the right way to go about it. You can't have people that have no medical experience, no drug experience, no counselling experience doing this stuff. This stuff is dangerous. Alcohol by itself, detoxing can kill you. So, putting someone in a room and going, fear Allah, fear Allah, fear Allah, and then he dies on you, then you fear Allah, and then fear the police. That's stupidity. So it's about looking into what's happening. It's a medical issue. It's a social issue. It's a crime issue. It's a community issue. This is something that is hunting our kids down one by one and taking them out. And our priorities are somewhere else. And you know what's funny? We've hardly spent any money yet. That's why I was on next the, the account has hardly been touched. Because these people, how much do you reckon their habit is? What's, some of them $600 a day, $100 a day, $1,000 a day. They can afford the counseling services, let me tell you. They just need someone to take them. Someone who understands it. Someone who's going to case manage them through the whole process. Someone who's going to talk to their parents. Someone who's going to find them a job. Someone that's not going to let them go when they fail again and again and again and again. That's when it works. No pretenders in this game. That's ludicrous. You want to fundraise, fundraise something else. Don't use this as an excuse to fundraise and kill people. The drugs side of the situation, everyone knows someone who's on it. 
Someone who's on it, someone who's building it, someone who has made his money from it. Let's do something about it, man. We want to keep our kids safe from this stuff. You know where it starts from? You. Raising your kids the right way to make the right decisions to be resilient and keep away from this crap. And raising kids that will help other kids from staying away from this crap too. Because it's not just about raising a child that's just for me. All right? Look after yourself, Dad. You do this for yourself. No, 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 no. Teach them to look after the woman. It's not just all my time in fundraising. For the ummah, for the ummah, for the ummah, 20 grand. In real life, when it's got to do with money, it's for me, for me, for me, for me. Really? If I teach my son or daughter that the key to success is helping their ummah, brother or sister, you know the difference that'll make? Then you'll see all of a sudden there's a surge for people that when they grow up, they want to do humanitarian work. They want to do charity work. They want to increase the welfare capacity of the society. Where the hell is our aged care facility? Where the hell is our rehab facility? Where, where's our women's refuges? Where's, oh, come on. Where's the Muslim private health hospital? Where is it? Where's the women's birth centers? Where's women's health? Where is it? How long have we been here? Well, let me tell you, go into your app, locate nearest masjid. I've got to scroll up and down for 10 pages. Did the population grow that much? Raise kids that are going to make the world easier for their kids and the kids after them. Because that's what we should have done. And while we've still got the chance right now, let's do that. That'll be good parenting. Oh,